What is good, everybody, man? Welcome back into the Blue Bloods as we continue our FCS player spotlight for the 2023 season. And we are here with my guy, Josiah Silver, New Hampshire defensive lineman. That Listen, the accolades are long. 2021 FCS All-American from eight, uh, the Associated Press, Stats Perform, Field Steel, was the CAA Defensive Rookie of the Year that season as a two-time First team all CAA selection. The Jerry Rice Award finalist was a 2022 consensus FCS All, all American selection and was a preseason All American selection from the Blue Bloods and already getting that honor from um, Athlon Sports as well, man. So, Josiah, appreciate you hopping on the show, man. Thank you for having me. Thank you for having me. I want to go back, though, man. You were so talented coming out of high school, man, on that Virginia circuit. I want to say you had 27 sacks your senior season what what like looking back now with some hindsight man how were those stats that success playing on a team who was 12 and 2 10 and 0 in your district why do you think the recruitment never took off like it should have um i say like when i was in high school um like before me my freshman year like playing in the peninsula district like we used to produce like a lot of power five kids like the last two kids when I was a freshman we had Daz Newsom and Jeremiah Wusu who are both in the league currently both those were the last two that went power five when I was in high school uh the biggest reason for me I want to say is just like the competition level went down as a whole and then speaking for my high school like my high school we produced like some of the like best athletes but like looking back at the history many do not like last in college so I think like schools were kind of like scared to like recruit because I have a boy named Corey Wilson who's at Hampton. He was a three star. And he ended up at Hampton University. So I just feel like uh, the past history that my high school had, like from like kids not panning out in college, kind of like hurt my class. But I take credit like me and my me and my uh, teammate Corey like we helped change that. Like now Phoebus like we have a kid named Jordan Bass who's going to Pitt. Uh, D tackle um, Michael McMullen, who's going to uh, JMU. So I think that was the biggest reason. But I mean, going back, I mean, I did everything you could. Like I went to camps. I was in. I was in contact with a whole bunch of college coaches, but none of them really wanted to give me a chance. So that's how I ended up here. Yeah, I was. About, that, that's where we were moving to next. Because I always, always like to ask guys, especially at the FCS level, because you get guys who came across the country. They're real far from their hometown. Man, you went from Hampton, Virginia, all the way up to New Hampshire. For you, how did New Hampshire emerge as the place that you wanted to sign? Uh, so going into December, so our football season, we lost in the playoffs, and the only offer I held at the time was Fordham, and. On my visit to Fordham, like, no disrespect to Fordham, I just couldn't, like, personally see myself going there. So um, I was still in, like, in thoughts. I was like, all right, well, am I going to go to a private school for, like, am I going to reclass? I, I didn't know what my future held. Um, then Coach Borden uh, reached out to me from New Hampshire, and I talked to my head coach, told my head coach, like, I think New Hampshire is about to offer you. I was like, is that Division One? Because that's all I cared about. Because I, <laughs> I had no idea where New Hampshire, like, where who it was. Um, and he told me it's there in the CAA. So once he told me in the CAA, I like, I knew JMU, Richmond. I'm like, oh, cool, cool. Like, um, so we got to talking. Um, and I took my official. And going on my official, I was like, okay, if I like it a little bit, I'm going to commit. And I turned out I liked it more than I thought I was and committed um, on the last day of my official visit. You get to campus, of course, the the COVID season kind of, I mean, it, it messed up everything for that first year. How did you approach that season knowing that the, it was probably not going to be a long season and weren't going to be many games, but how did that prepare you for your ultimate 2021 breakout season that we'll get into next? Okay, so um, – that COVID year, so I was kind of bad. Like, so that whole time COVID, I was 225, and I thought that I needed to put weight on to be, like, productive at the college level. So from from May to August, I put on, like, 20 pounds. I came to college at, like, 240. And so 
that whole like I lost what I was good at. Like my I was I've been like known for like my um, quickness and like speed off the ball. So I came to college and like the first like we were we practiced all fall because we didn't have the season, and it. I like COVID like actually was a blessing and a curse because obviously like you wanted to play a season, but I got to come in and like learn how fast the college game was in the semester. Like I didn't have to rush through camp to learn a playbook and have to get rushed in to like pick up how fast the game was. So COVID like blessed, blessed me. And like I had two good mentors and Gunnar Gibson and Brian Carter who took me under their wing and like, taught me the game so that was that was the biggest thing like I got to come in and practice at the college level and not be in no rush to like worried about like because most of the time camp starts in August you have from August that whole month to figure everything out see I had from August to December to figure everything out so It, it definitely worked out well, man, because that 2021 season, you lead the CAA in pretty much every major statistic for a defensive lineman. You rank top 10 in the country for sacks, tackles for loss, forced fumbles. But when I look at that season, I went back and watched some film. It was really those last two games. I want to say Rhode Island and Maine, where you just took it to another level. I'm looking here, six sacks, eight tackles for loss, and 23 total tackles for a defensive lineman in just two games. What click, man? Uh, so my whole goal going into like every year I played college football, my goal was to get double digit sacks and then going into the Rhode Island game, it was crazy. Cause I, I was like, I almost didn't play that game. Cause I had, <laughs> I had injured my knee, um, the week before against Albany, like in the last like three minutes. And, um, so going into the game, I just wanted to like show out. And then it was just one of those games where, I mean, I was just getting back there, getting sacks, finished with two strip sacks. It was just one of them games that you, like, dreamed of as a kid. And then Maine, Maine is the rivalry game. And I found out that I needed three sacks to break the record. So going into that game, that was on my mind, uh, finished one short. So that was really the mindset of those last two games. I just wanted to ball out and reach all my goals. You definitely did that, man. But there was a coaching change after the season. As a team, you guys didn't get to the spot you guys wanted to go. Head coach Ricky Santos comes in. How difficult was that coaching change just for you as a player when when staff changes, head coaching changes, there's a course of change in the culture in the locker room. For you, looking back now, how difficult was that for you as a player? So the crazy, so Coach Santos was the head coach, like the interim head coach mm-hmm. in the time when my class was like signing. So mm-hmm. I I met Coach Santos before I actually met Coach Mack. Oh, wow. And so the process honestly wasn't difficult because, like, Coach Santos was always in the locker room. He was always, like, everyone knew he was up next. We just didn't know when. Um, the saddest, the hardest thing about it was, like, honestly having Coach Mack go out the way he did. Because, like, everyone in the locker room, like, respects, like, Coach, Coach Mack is a legend, FCS mm-hmm. legend. And we just wanted to like send them out on a better note than the three and eight season. So that was probably the most difficult thing. But Coach Santos is being the head coach, like everything was smooth. Like he under like our whole coaching staff is young. So everyone understands like how how it feels to be a player, what it takes to be a player. They just relate to us so well. Well, I don't think anyone can relate to the success that you're having at New Hampshire more than head coach Santos. I mean, exactly. won the Walter Payton Award. I mean, probably one of the most legendary players to play at New Hampshire. Yeah. What is he like as a head coach behind the scenes? I got to talk to him at a press conference, and the energy's off the charts. But, man, yeah. behind the scenes with you, what is he like? Man, Coach Santos is – I don't even know how to put it in words. He's, like, one of the most genuine, caring people I, like, ever met, like – Everyone who's around him, he wants to see them successful. So, like, he, he'll go out his way just for, like, he'll make sure, check up on us, see if we're all good. Man, I don't even know how to put it in words, honestly. Santa, Coach Santos is a really great person. Um, never met someone who, like, would go out his way to make sure, like, we're straight. Um, and we had a bet um, this year. He told me if I um, break the sack record, he would unretire two for me. 
came up one short. But that's like the type of person he is. Like he just wants everyone around him to be successful. Man, I I know. So so what is it with the number two, man? You got to let me know. What, what what's up? So I mean, I personally never wanted to. I just wanted eight. That that's been my goal. <laughs> like number all all my football. Like I always wanted to wear it because I never was allowed to because I play offensive line. Uh, but with, he come up to me. Uh, it was like one day after practice, and um, he was like, um, "How many sacks you need to break the record?" I was like, "I need three more." He's like, all right, if you break the record, like I'll unretire too, and you could wear it for the, wear it next season. I was like, I'm like, I right, I can't turn that down. Like the legend, the legend of the school is going unretired numbers, so I tried to go get it, but came up worse. So like, oh, but hey, I feel your pain, though, man. Look, <laughs> I played offensive line, and there were so many numbers I wish I could have, and you were just stuck. It was like yeah. it was from fifty to seventy nine, and I played tackle. So I didn't even get the 50s. It was like you either had to be in the like high 60s or it really yeah. just locked into the 70s. And I was so mad because my favorite player growing up was I played D-line before I got to high school. 99 was my number. I was a huge Warren Sapp fan. That was okay. the guy I looked up yeah. to. Well, then I played offensive tackle full time. And they were like, you can't have 99. And I was like, that's the only number I really want. And I, So I feel your pain, man. And yeah, at least in my- D-line now, they unlocked a lot of numbers for you guys. So. Yeah. My People number kinda... journey, my number and journey in high school was terrible. So I went, <laughs> well, what number was it? So I went freshman year. I was a tight end. Uh, I wore eighty seven on JV, and then I got moved up to varsity for the playoffs. And they put me in sixty seven because I was the only <laughs> number, <laughs> only number available. Oh, get, to oh, my, but... get to my sophomore year. I'm in eighty seven again because I'm playing tight end. We get the week one. Um, boom, they moved me to tackle. I'm in 79. And then I, I was in 55 uh, my junior and senior year. So that was like two cool years. But, man. I feel that. But my worst number was probably 62. I got that seventh grade year, and I got 62. <laughs> but throughout high school, man, it was always 70. Like, that's I just stuck with 70. I was like, yeah. I'll, I'll go with that. That's not bad. But, <laughs> not man, bad. going into last season, you guys went, go from three and eight to CAA co-chance of William & Mary, man. Get that ring, get that trophy. How did you guys turn it around so quickly? Man, honestly, we all just – we I, we all came in as a team. Like, I want to say our biggest problem in 2021 was, like, we, like, we were individuals. Like, we were individuals on a team, and we came back this year, and we tried to bring back the brotherhood bond that New Hampshire was built on, like, the legacy is there at UNH, um, like 14 straight playoffs. So we were just trying, we didn't want to be that class, like that team to like just not risk where it used to be. So honestly, like with Coach Santos coming, coming in, uh, his whole mindset was just to bring everyone back together and we all just play as one team and just go out there. And we, like, we always had the talent. It just sometimes didn't show. Like Dylan Lobby's always been here. Max Brosmer finally came back from injury, so that helped our offense. And then a lot of key guys stepped up. So it was a fun year, man. So I got to ask you, man, is that main game? You guys have to win that game to clinch the co-championship. <laughs> and, man, that game was so nerve-wracking just for me to watch. <laughs> Overtime, one-point win, man. Walk me through that game and just how, like, that sense of relief for you guys, man, to clinch the championship like in that rivalry game, too. Man. So, like, going into the game, like, like during the game, we were up 20 – it was like 21-7. to 7. So, I'm like, mm-hmm. oh, yeah, like, we – this is going to be easy. Next thing I know, like, that's that's a good thing about this rivalry, though. Like, it will never be a blowout. Like, both main, like, no matter how good or bad the teams are, it's always going to be a good game. So, I learned to find that out. Next thing I know, it's a tie game. You go to overtime. Offense gets a touchdown. I'm like, oh, yeah, like, defense, this is what we dreamed of. Like, we're on the field to get one stop. That's all we need. Get them the fourth down. And they pull out the craziest trick play I've seen. <laughs> get a screen, throw back, touchdown. So I'm sitting here like, oh, like, all right. I'm thinking, like, I'm like, all right, I've been watching NFL. Like, they're going to go for two. Let's go for two, two-point conversion. I'm like, all right, just one stop. This is this is our season right here. And then my man Bryce Shaw catches the pick. 
man, I never ran so fast that musket, <laughs> like in so excitement, man. It was, oh my gosh. The the oh, feeling of that game being over was the best feeling ever. I can see the emotion on the show. I mean, you guys <laughs> celebrated like it was like the it was like the natty man. on that one, man. You guys went crazy. And I don't blame you, man. That was a intense game to clinch. The, the championship man but looking looking at you guys you guys go to the fcs playoffs you guys beat fordham in the first round play a close game in the second round um w- with holy cross for you though just as as one of the leaders man what could you say was your biggest takeaway from that fcs playoff run last year uh the for- let's we'll start off with a good note like the fordham win man like we came out put up 52 points like and we were supposed to play like the number we was playing the number one FCS offense, held them to like their season low. Um, so takeaways from that, man, it was amazing to like get the taste of an FCS playoff win. Going to the Holy Cross game, um, we let our emotions like get get under us a little bit. Um, and we played out of like out of character. The rain and playing on grass didn't help. But I mean, I, I feel like like the takeaways is like we just have to stay under composure from like from now on like no like nothing should really get under our skins and then now like we have a goal like we're bringing back so many so much talent like none of us want to taste the defeat of like losing in the second round again especially like with the talent we're bringing back so I, th- I think you see that a lot of teams like that first time getting to the playoffs is kind of a shock and you see them, you know, exit a little bit earlier than a lot of people predicted. But then that next year they get there is when they finally put it all together. I know that's what a lot of people are projecting for you guys, preseason top 10 votes, et cetera. But for you, man, we talked before the show, the CAA has two of the best defensive line duos in the country yourself and, and Dylan Ruiz being one of those. What is your relationship with Dylan man on the defensive line and how much like for you guys playing together, how, how do you guys have that chemistry where it doesn't matter if you go out and get two, three sacks. It doesn't matter if he does it. You guys always just seem to build off each other. Uh, so going into it before the season started, I tried to tell the world about Dylan, like, I've seen the potential in him, like, since day one. Like, he's been this very explosive edge rusher who, when it comes to pass rushing, and he's in the tier of his own, one of a kind. Um, So I've been trying to tell the world about him. But, man, me and him really got closer as the season went on because at first we had Gunnar Gibson and Dylan was behind him. Um, But the start of this season, like, we both had the goals, like, both of our dreams is to play in the NFL. So, like, we just build on each other. So, like, if I need advice on something, I go to him. If he needs advice, he comes to me. So, it's, like, one of those relationships, like, where we build off each other. And both of us just want to see, like, each other successful. So, like, when he go gets a sack, um, if you could ever see in the clip, we're, like, we're always dancing with each other. Like, that's really, like, one of my, like, like we're currently staying in my apartment back in New Hampshire because he didn't have a place to stay. That's how, like, close we are. Man, that, that's awesome to hear. I know you two are going to do huge things again, man. But, you know, shifting to some to some quick hitters, man. And one last question before we shift to those. Looking at your game, I want you to compare Josiah Silver's game, true freshman year, stepping fresh on campus, to the guy I'm talking to now. What's the single biggest developmental change you've seen in your game? Uh, so, honestly, it's just the understanding of it. When I came in as a true freshman the COVID year, I didn't understand football. Like, I just understood what I had to do. I never could look at an offensive formation and tell you, like, uh, okay, I think it's pass here or I think it's run. Now, like, I'm able to, like, step on the field and, like, I look at my offensive tackle. I'm like, okay, well, he's giving me this key. I know it's this. I'd say that's, like, the biggest development. And now, like, so my breakout year, I was 225. And now I'm back up to 240, but like the good 240. So now it's like, all right, now I could put in my bag to have power rushes. Like I'm, I'm not just straight speed no more. Like I have a a variety of moves in my um, arsenal now. Man, I know there's some offensive tackles that are going to be listening to this terrified when they hear that you're 240 now after they had some issues blocking you at 225. But man, man, looking at your game um, real quick, man, looking at your game, is there a current or former NFL player that you feel like you model the most? So my whole 
ever since I became – like, ever since I played DN, I always tried to model my game after Von Miller, someone who's very explosive and could bend. And, like, so, like, that's why I currently, like, want to model my game after. But, like, currently, I can see a little bit of, like, Bradley Chubb, things like that. I just want to be explosive and show that I have speed. So that's really the biggest thing. Looking back back through your career and practice during the COVID season or your first year in 2021, what was your welcome to college moment on the field? Oh, oh yeah, I got it. So we had, <laughs> we had just put the uh, pads on, and I was getting, like, when I first got in, I was getting reps with the twos. And, like, coming from high school, like, having 27 sacks, like, um, I wasn't – I thought I was, like, the man. Um, come in practice, I got pancaked, like, like it was it was bad. And, like, I got frustrated because I'm like, man, I've never been pancaked before. And then we get to, like, my teammate Gunner come up to me. He's like, hey, man, like, remember, like, this is college. Like, everyone's on this team for a reason. Like, like it's going to happen every now and then. Just don't focus on it. And I was like, all right, like, this is college. Like, it's not what I was doing back in high school. So that was really – that's probably, like, yeah, that was my welcome to college moment right there. I think I think everyone has everyone has that moment, especially um, you know looking back. Um, j- just everyone's got to remember that everyone was recruited and everyone was probably the star at their high school and, exactly. and et cetera, man. But I'll be honest, man. I know I know how it is playing offensive line. I I know you had a history at offensive line too. The trash talk when you got the same guy every single play, all game gets intense. How big of a trash talker are you in between those white lines? So honestly, I'm not that much of a trash talker. I will only trash talk if you say something to me. Um, but, like, like most of the games I've played in, like, most of the tackles, like, won't say nothing. It'll be, be the offensive guards. I'm Like, they'll, like, try to piggyback, like, oh, you suck. I'm like, I don't even know your name. Like, come on. Like, it, but I'm really – I don't really know what to say when it comes to trash talking. So, I just let my game do the talking. And if you got something to say, then I'll let you just talk because it's not – you can't prove it. <laughs> That's a fact. I, listen, I'll be honest, man. But when you got four sacks and you know five tackles for loss, I don't know if there's much trash talking going on from the other side. But looking at your game, man, one on one with an offensive tackle, what's the number one mistake an offensive lineman can make against you? Honestly, just shooting their hands too early. I I say that's the one of the best things I have is like how precise my hands with my hand timing is. So like. You shoot too early, and I, when I hit them right, it's like it's a recipe for disaster right there. Looking back through your career, what's one or two offensive players that you that what are one or two of the best offensive players that you've ever had to face in college? So I would say practice wise, Dylan Lobby, best offensive player I've I've ever. How fast he is. Like, I've never seen him get, like, when he gets green grass, he scores. Like, even in practice. Like, what he does in the game <laughs> is no shocker, like, at all. But um, in games, I would say Rhode Island's Taco, who's um, who's going to Oregon now. Oh, oh um, uh, a Johnny Cornelius. Yeah, he was pretty good. Um, especially last year. I mean, the first time we played, I had four, but. This year, he caught me with a pull groin. Uh, but he was a, a really good tackle. Richmond's tackle, uh, I think his name is Joe. He's pretty good. He was an All-American last year, I believe. Oh, I think he graduated, if I'm not mistaken. But, yeah, no, I, I think I know who you're talking about. And then, let's see. I, obviously, the Pitt team we played, like, Kenny Pitt, oh, yeah. and then, yeah, they got that. <laughs> yeah, <I'm, laughs> that team was so loaded, yeah, man. It, yeah, they it's, that team, Yeah, because um, that's when they had Addison, right, too, at wide receiver. God, Lord, man. And they had the defensive the line, too. They had the D line, too, on the other side that was – stacked because I had someone tell me because I know you're from kind of more that area because I'm from Mobile, Alabama and you know everyone down here they're like everyone thinks high school football down here is just the end all be all like it, yeah. we'll have a whole conversation about that but I talked to someone last year who covers the MEAC and he was like man if you, people really saw the talent in like the northeast around Pitt in Virginia yeah. he, they were like they were like I promise you it's in the same conversation as the south man it's 
it's kind of it's crazy like the respect Virginia like Virginia doesn't get the respect it should when it comes to high school football because if you really pull up like like you pull up like the athletes who've came through Virginia you're gonna see a, like a whole list like Michael Vick, Allen Iverson like the list is like that's just from my area that's not even like this the whole state of Virginia I just feel like we don't get the respect that we should when it comes to high school sports but. It, it is, hey, I, it is. It, it's a media machine down here, man. I'm telling you, it's probably. I think it's because we don't have any professional teams really down here. Yeah. Like, that's the difference. Is everyone's just hyper focused on like high school and college football. But man, the final two questions before I let you get out of here, man. First off, what would it mean to you to be the next player from New Hampshire to hear their name selected in the NFL draft in two years when you come out? Man, that that's really that's really the goal. Um, I've been dreaming that, dreaming about it as a kid. Ever since I played football, like my goal is to like play in the next level and hear my name on draft day. It's so, like to hear it like finally come true. I'll be the day come true. Like I know the work, like the work won't be over, but like just to have the satisfaction, satis- oof, just to hear my name <laughs> being called, like that's that's gonna mean the world to me. Like all my hard work is finally paying off towards the end, and then go try to be one of the best NFL players ever. If an NFL franchise asks you what they're going to get in Josiah Silver, if they select you in the if in one of the upcoming NFL drafts, man, what do you tell them? Um, they're going to get a, a young man who's willing to work. You could put me at wherever you need. If you need me to go play special teams, I'm doing it. If you need someone to go do anything, I'm there. You're just going to get a hardworking kid who knows the game of – who's starting to understand the game of football. And I'm just that kid who's who has dreams to be very successful. I, real quick, man, just a quick follow up. I know you're one of the one of the guys who came in during COVID, so you had that extra year of eligibility. Yep. Is that something you're going to sit down with your family, your coaches after the season, and decide whether you declare this year? Or are you for sure coming back for another year after this one? So um, that's that's been um, in conversation. So. Uh, that's up in the air, honestly. It depends on how – well, it depends on when I have the year I know I'm going to have to speak it into existence. Um, then we're going to go from there. Um, as of right now, if you was to ask me, like, right now, the year I believe I'm going to have, I don't think I will be coming back to UNH for another year. But who knows? Uh, only guy knows, and I'm going to just go from there, honestly. Man, I I appreciate you so much, man, for hopping on the show. Man, we did almost thirty minutes, and it definitely didn't feel like thirty at all. But I definitely didn't. <laughs> but man, real quick, it's all about player promotion. Let people know where they can find you on social media. I know you got some merch out there, man. I need to go cop me a, a shirt or a hoodie, man. So let people know where I they actually, can find that yeah. too. Oh, I think I got it all. No. There you go. Jojo, no, um, you can go find me on Instagram at um, Jojo dot Reckless um, Twitter. Is Josiah Silver 8, and those are the only two I really be on. Guys, his link to his merch is in his bio. I know on Instagram for sure, man, so make sure to go cop a shirt, a hoodie, something, man. Support all FCS players, man. It, it goes a really, really long way. Make sure to go follow Josiah on all social media. Big season coming up for my guy. But, guys, for Josiah Silver, for myself, and for the Blue Bloods, man, we are out for right now. <laughs>